On the service bench we have a 1961 Motorola transistor radio model AX4B and it's going to be getting some new capacitors installed. Here is a look at the PC board. There are four electrolytic capacitors. We have an axial unit right here and you can see it's got a 6129 date code. We've got a couple more right here. And this one with the red end, the positive end. That, uh, that cap is open. So that's the main reason why this radio doesn't function. I believe it's a 6 microfarad at 10 volt. And we got another one here. I've yet to determine its value. And we have a radial mount unit right here. A 50 at 15. And again we have all 1961 date codes throughout. These are all domestic parts on this unit manufactured at the Franklin Park plant. Here's a look at the underside of the board. Let's make sure none of these capacitors fall over the tuning string because that can be a hazard. Looks like we just miss them. So that's a good thing. I don't have to worry about my soldering iron touching that cord and melting it. Have the under unsolder the uh, the ferret rod AM antenna. Three small wires here. Simple control with the micro tip uh, tweezers. And we also have this other end of the antenna lead that connects to the tuning capacitor. So we'll go ahead and get started on the recap. The new capacitors are now installed. And as you can see I had to remove the tuning string. I didn't think I had to before but apparently my judgment wasn't that good earlier. The, uh, the string fell right over the center of uh, a couple capacitor uh, terminal points down here. So I had to pull that off. It's right over here, unharmed. And here are the new caps. I had to touch up some of the original solder connections. This board was originally wave soldered and part of the problem, and it's not so much the wave soldering's fault, this board is so thick and as a result with the thickness of the board and a very large diameter of the hole for the uh, component there's a lot of solder to be filled in that void and what happens is the solder cools at the bottom and it creates an air pocket and it kind of punctures through the top and you have a hole and it's kind of hard to, cl to, to clean that up. You kind of go over it with your soldering iron a few times in steps so that you get those little air pockets filled in. But it's all good to go now. I had to pull that capacitor off. That was uh, that was right in the way of changing this cap right here, this 22 at 25. There's the old caps. Again, that was the troublemaker right here. That one was wide open. Say uh, 6 at 10. Just check that on the ESR meter here. 
and we're ready to put it all back together and see how it works. Just got to string that tuning cord back on and we'll be good to go. The circuit board has been reinstalled into the radio. Unfortunately, all of the plastic bosses for the screws were in good shape. You can see right here, a lot of times these will split here or they'll just shatter or break off right at the uh, right at the base where it mounts to the uh, faceplate of the radio. But these were in good shape so I didn't have to deal with that problem. The AM antenna has been reinstalled. Got the leads soldered back on where they originally were. And also the white lead here that goes right to the tuning capacitor. Get a look here in some better light. So we're ready to reinstall the back panel. But you probably noticed that this radio has an unusual styled connector for the battery. We'll take a look here at the model tag. Notice how it says to use the Everetti 2761. Well that is a 9 volt battery as the tag indicates. But that battery hasn't been made in many many years. And according to, uh, to a guy I talked to on an internet radio forum, he said that, ra that battery's been obsolete since 1964. Now, I don't know how much truth there is to that, but he said in his 1964 Burgess catalog that battery was not listed. But the year prior it was, so who knows. You can see it was a relatively large battery, just a rectangular shape. So it led me to believe this radio must have had some pretty high current draw because the standard 9 volt battery that we know today, the NEDA 1604, was introduced in 1956. So why they wouldn't have used that then led me to believe that it was once again because of the high current draw ability of the radio. So seeing that that battery doesn't exist anymore I made a simple little alligator clip assembly that goes on to the 9 volt connector. And I could just clip that directly to the terminals here and I don't have to compromise the originality of the radio because I don't want to cut that off. So uh, for fun I decided to take the Simpson 260 right here and I measured the current draw on that battery and at full volume it was pulling about 60 milliamps which really isn't that bad because a standard you know smaller transistor radio that was designed for a 9 volt that was only pulling about 50 amps 50 milliamps so uh, I guess Motorola's thought behind using this big 9 volt battery was so it would last many years so to speak you know it was intended to be used as a table radio they didn't want you changing the battery that much but the good news is the little 9 volt here is perfectly adequate to power this thing without concern that you're going to drain it too quickly so I'll put it all back together and I'll show you how I make it all fit. It's pretty simple. And now the back of the radio has been reinstalled. As you can see the 9 volt battery is secured by means of a piece of foam. And this is just half inch thick. It can be purchased at any uh, fabric store. And you just bend it in half and it sandwiches perfectly between these two parts of the radio cover and it gives just the right amount of tension to keep the battery from from moving around inside the cabinet 
and I've got the alligator clips here simply clipped onto the original battery connector. So the original integrity of the radio has not been altered in any way. So now you can just simply reinstall the back cover here. Just get the uh, get the screws started. We'll get those tightened down here. We'll take a look at the front of the radio now. And here it is. Fully reassembled. This radio has such a nice early 60's style to it. It's one of the reasons I like it so much. It's got the Motorola name down here in the trim on the lower left. Also the logo. And the speaker grill is a light blue color while the rest of the cabinet is an off-white. The clear acrylic lens has a reverse painted mark for the tuning indicator. Well, the tuning dial itself just rotates right behind the lens. And again, it's got a very narrow profile. It's got the little stars on the back cover that you saw. So it was designed to be a table radio, yet give you the flexibility of being able to bring it from room to room making it a real unique piece. So now that the new capacitors are installed, let's try it out and see how it works. You're sponsored by Pugi Hyundai Mazda Volkswagen. When Concordia University men's bat... Clip Chicago, 720 WGN. follow the instant traffic up. And second of all, the, the quality of the calcium that comes from our diet. Our territory. Proton therapy is a cutting edge treatment and it's Medicare approved. Plus it causes less damage to surrounding health. It's got nice issues, sound. the risk of side effects. Uh, that was really important to me. I didn't have to say. 339. I got to get out there because I am giving gasoline uh, stockings an hour. Uh, hit the so-called middle income taxpayers as well as uh, reduce the negative impact on things like capital gains and dividends and might even be able to hold the estate tax where it is. Right, so yes, yeah, so actually that was in Boehner's plan B. I was thinking, I mean my thought here... I, Chief Dodge Ram here. Thank you. 